rather than hurts the ability of our communities to receive disaster relief. And I yield back. The gentleman yield back. Uh, the general lady from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to my friend from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, the chair designate of the Military Construction and Veteran Affairs Subcommittee of Appropriations. The general lady from Florida is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentlewoman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this essential emergency supplemental appropriations bill. H.R. 268 totals $12.14 billion in emergency disaster appropriations funding to provide relief and recovery assistance for Americans affected by recent hurricanes, typhoons, wildfires, and other natural disasters, especially in my home state of Florida. The MILCON VA portion of the bill provides $860.4 million for Department of Defense military construction needs and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Specifically, the bill includes $115 million for the Marine Corps to begin planning for construction projects related to the devastation left behind the Hurricanes Florence and Michael on Marine Corps facilities in North Carolina at New River, Cherry Point, and Lejeune. The Marine Corps is planning facility consolidation efforts as a result of this severe damage. And this funding represents the first step in a vital rebuilt rebuilding process for the Marine Corps. Mr. Speaker, the bill also includes $700 million to begin the rebuilding of Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida's Panhandle. This funding will support the relocation of the F-22 mission and the bed down of F-35s, along with the planning for construction of new facilities there. This funding is a crucial first step to begin the necessary rebuilding of Tyndall, which we will rebuild. Mr. Speaker, I also want to point out that this funding for Tyndall in North Carolina is just a down payment. Congress is going to need to provide much more support to get these locations back on their feet. And this administration should take the time to address these real emergencies and not the ones they've manufactured. Finally, this bill includes a continuing resolution to reopen our government, which is now in its 26th day of being shut down. Mr. Speaker, as I said just yesterday, the Trump shutdown is continuing to inflict serious financial pain and anxiety on families, businesses, and communities across the United States. Opening the government is not a poison pill. It is our duty. This legislation will enable the areas affected by the hurricanes to begin to rebuild the communities and military installations that are vital to our national defense and those local economies, as well as provide relief to 800,000 federal workers and their families who are living under a cloud of economic security right now. I urge all members of this body to cast a yes vote and yield back the balance of my time, which I have. The gentle lady <laughs> yields back. The gentle lady from Florida. I mean, from Texas. Four minutes to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice. The gentleman from South Carolina is uh, recognized for how long? For four minutes. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I hail from the seventh district of South Carolina, and for three days in September, the nation was wrapped as Hurricane Florence stalled directly on top of my district. I have eight counties in my district. All eight counties were declared disaster areas. Uh, the inland counties were inundated as North Carolina was, and all the rain that fell in North Carolina and in, in those inland counties comes through five river systems out Georgetown County, South Carolina. And so my, my district was overcome by a slow motion rolling disaster. And if that wasn't bad enough, that was the third storm in four years. Hurricane Matthew hit us uh, three years ago. In Hurricane Matthew, the federal government awarded us $95 million to rebuild 1,350 houses for indigent families. And at the speed the federal government moves, as of now, two and a half years after the storm, about 400 of those 1,300 homes have been rebuilt. So we've got about 1,000 indigent South Carolinians either gone or living in substandard housing. Now, in this storm, 12,163 homes were quote unquote moderately damaged. I asked the definition of moderate damage. They said that means that there was water inside the house, but it was less than two feet deep. My friends, we also incurred $200 million of agricultural damage. In these last two storms, our agricultural department didn't even ask for help with, from the federal government, but the farmers are at their wits end. A farmer told me that three years ago, they used their cash Last storm, they used their equity, and now they're at the end of their rope. And we will be losing South Carolina farmers if we don't help these people. 
So I was prepared to, re to uh, support this. And House Republicans passed this disaster bill as part of the supplemental in December. Now the Democrats bring it back up and it is subject to opening the government up with no wall funding. And they know full well that the president wouldn't sign it if, even if we did pass it. This is a political game and they're playing to win. But, the, but what they're playing with, the pieces that they're playing with are hurting people in South Carolina. They're damaged people in South Carolina. They're suffering people who are on their knees. Three of the counties that were hit the hardest, Marion, Dillon, and Marlboro counties, are some of the poorest counties in South Carolina. Overwhelmingly African-American. These people had nothing before the storm and what little they had has been taken away. And we're using these people as pawns in this fight over the government shutdown. My friends, enough is enough. It's time to stop paying, playing politics. As, uh, as my friend across the aisle said earlier, uh, leaders don't hold people hostage, they, they find solutions. And it's time to find a solution. You know full well that by attaching this continuing resolution to this disaster bill, it will not pass this House, it won't get a hearing in the Senate, and the President won't sign it. All this is for show. Enough show. Let's deliver this relief to the people who need it. The storm hit my area September the 14th, four months ago. Enough show. Stop using these indigent people as pawns. Enough. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentle lady from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, before I introduce our next, I would like to say to the distinguished gentleman from South Carolina, I agree with the distinguished gentleman from South Carolina. Let's stop this political game. Let's direct our remarks. Let's make clear that the president has the responsibility to open this government and to do it now. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson. I thank the chairwoman for yielding and for all that she's doing to end the Trump shutdown and open up our government. But I rise today to engage in a colloquy with the distinguished chairwoman of the Homeland Security Appropriations Subcommittee, Congresswoman Royball Allard, in regard to a commitment made between the two of us. My district in the state of California uh, were once again ravaged by devastating and historic fires. In my own district, the Mendocino Complex fire burned a combined total of 460,000 acres, making it the largest physical fire in California history. As a result, a major disaster declaration was announced for Lake County, which sadly has been rocked with fires for the past several years. California also experienced the deadliest and most destructive fire in our state's history with a campfire, which tragically took the lives of more than 60 people. The town of Paradise, which was home to almost 27,000 people, was near completely destroyed, and more than 12,000 structures were burned to the ground. In addition, our state experienced other devastating fires, and uh, they continue, we need the continued support from the federal government because it's essential as residents seek to build, to rebuild, and California begins long-term recovery. In response to these devastating disasters, I offered a bipartisan amendment with Representatives LaMalfa, Lou, Calvert and Garamendi, and Huffman, and 19 other bipartisan co-sponsors from our state. This amendment provided much needed relief to the state of California and local entities uh, by increasing to 90% the federal cost share for debris removal and emergency assistance for the 2018 wildfires. The substance of this amendment has been supported by both the speaker and the majority leader and is consistent with the relief generously provided in the 113th Congress. The distinguished chairwoman and I have discussed this amendment and the importance of Congress providing this much needed relief to the state of California and all affected com uh, communities impacted by these fires. I thank her for her commitment an and- extra minute, Mr. Minutes, uh, I recognize for another two minutes. One minute. Uh, I thank uh, Representative uh, Mike Thompson for his diligent work on behalf of his fire-impacted communities and our state. 
It is critical that Congress ensures that every federal resource is made available to the state, local governments, and all affected communities of the historic and unprecedented 2018 wildfires. Ensuring that Californians get the support and resources they need is not a partisan issue. It is particularly frustrating that the FEMA has the sole discretion to adjust these cost shares and often does so after catastrophic disasters or when multiple disasters strike the same state in a short period of time as we have experienced in California. The state of California has requested the administration to adjust these cost shares, unfortunately, to no avail. Mr. Thompson, I appreciate your diligent work on this issue. I remain committed to working with you, our leadership, and the bipartisan co-sponsors of your amendment to provide in the Department of Homeland Security's the full year fiscal year 2019 funding bill an increased cost share of 90% for these additional categories of federal disaster funding for California communities the devastated the by the 2018 wildfire. The gentle lady's fire. time's expired. Yes, okay. okay. The gentlewoman from New York. 30 seconds. Uh, another 30 seconds to the gentle lady from California. Uh, oh, from the gentleman from California. Just in closing, uh, in the meantime, I will work with you and the other members of the California delegation on pursuing this matter with the administration on this reasonable and much needed adjustment within its existing authority. Thank I you, think. Madam Chair, and thanks to the bipartisan co-authors of this measure. Look forward to working with you and appreciate your help. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman now yields his time back. The gentle lady from Texas. I rise to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Florida for the purposes of colloquy. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for purposes uh, of colloquy. I thank the gentlewoman from Texas for yielding and also for the opportunity to bring up an important issue to my district and state. As you all know, Hurricane Michael had a devastating effect on my district. One of the most important areas in my district that was destroyed was Tyndall Air Force Base. The underlying bill before the House today contains $700 million for planning, design, and construction related to the consequences of Hurricane Michael at Tyndall Air Force Base. This funding would support the relocation of the F-22s, the bed down of the F-35s, and the planning of facility construction so that the base can continue to recover. This is a down payment for the Air Force, and it signals that Congress is committed to rebuilding Tyndall Air Force Base because Tyndall will need additional funds. Will the gentleman yield? I am happy to yield to my fellow Floridian, uh, Representative Wasserman Schultz. I thank the gentleman for yielding. As a fellow Floridian, I support the need to rebuild Tyndall, as I just mentioned in my open, opening statement, and support the Air Force's next generation aircraft. It is important to ensure that our airmen and their families have state-of-the-art facilities that support the new mission. And I look forward to working with you and Chairwoman Granger as we begin the process to ensure future funding is available to continue this vital reconstruction of Tyndall Air Force Base. And I yield back. I would like to thank Chairman Wasserman Schultz for agreeing to work with me going forward to address appropriate funding levels and types of facilities that will be necessary to bring Tyndall back to life. And I yield to the gentlewoman from Texas. I thank my colleagues for this colloquy. Tyndall Air Force Base is vital to Florida and the United States. I look forward to working with the gentleman as well as the gentlewoman and chairman of the Military Construction Subcommittee to rebuild this base. Does the gentleman from Florida yield his time back? The gentleman's time has expired. The woman from New York. Is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Mississippi, the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, Mr. Thompson. The gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentlelady from New York for giving me the time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of H.R. 268, a bill to help our country recover from a, another year of devastating natural disasters. In 2018, Americans across the country faced extreme hardship due to hurricanes, wildfires, and other catastrophic events. 
from Hurricane Michael and Florence in the southeast to historic wildfires in the west and volcanic activity in Hawaii, no part of our nation was spared. Last week, the president responded to these events by callously proclaiming on Twitter that he plans to stop aid to wildfire survivors in California. This behavior is not in the spirit of our great nation. The funding provided in this bill will show the American people that we stand with them, even if the president does not. Importantly, in response to Hurricane Maria, it provides $600 million to Puerto Rico for debris removal and restoration of its electric grid. Additionally, the bill provides much needed funding to communities across the nation for Head Start, farmers who suffered crop losses, and Americans with housing needs. I have firsthand knowledge of the challenges after a devastating hurricane. It took years and sustained, sustained commitment from the federal government to help my community recover from Hurricane Katrina. H.R. 268 will help put our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico on a critical path to recovery. Additionally, I support the McGovern Amendment to prevent the president from raiding the Army Corps of Engineers funds to build his border wall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and with that, I yield back. The gentleman yield his time back. The gentle lady from Texas is recognized. I yield five minutes to the gentle lady from Puerto Rico, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. The gentle lady from Puerto Rico is recognized Thank you. Thank for you, five Speaker minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and uh, Ms. Ranking Member. Uh, today, I rise in support of the Nutrition Assistance Program Blog Grant or NAP that is included in the bill and, and under consideration today. NAP is the sole source of nutrition assistance and food security for over 1.3 million American citizens in, in the island. After Hurricane Maria, uh, Congress, the 115 Congress approved an additional $1.2 billion increase in Puerto Rico NAP program, in addition to the annual drug grant amount of uh, about $1.8 billion. And that means that we got a lot of people that we, we have a, a lot of necessities, and the disaster relief allowed it to have an increase in the benefits and to, to the current beneficiaries, as well as an increase to enrollment to bring assistance to close to 153,000 uh, new participants in the program. However, this additional assistance is currently set to be ex uh, expended in March of this year. And the program funding will be uh, then lowered again to the base amount associated with the block grants. That is why, in May of last year, uh, I submitted an amendment to the HR number two, known as a Farm Bill, to increase the amount of funding a lot to Puerto Rico's NAP. Again, in December, we got a, a letter and uh, a meeting uh, asking for those $600 million uh, in addition to NAP funding. And it, during the first day of Congress, we, we did the same thing to both committees of appropriations and, and rules with the same request. So I want to thank uh, the, chair, uh, the chairwoman of the committee for including uh, that uh, money uh, in this uh, in this bill. Uh, we got a meeting in December with the governor of Puerto Rico uh, and uh, minority leader um, and the chairwoman asking for this $600 million increase to Puerto Rico NAP program. So uh, we really need uh, this money to be uh, included and be available until, until fiscal year uh, 2020. But this, uh, this bill also contains an important provision for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands as well. Extending the 100% federal cost share for assistance under the Stafford Act for this disasters in the territories to be rebuild to the current standards. That was included in the last provision last, uh, in the last Congress. So having this extension is important in order uh, to maximize the resources. This is critical since the losses caused by caused by this disaster left our communities with no position to, to cover uh, or to uh, have the matching funds requirement. And believe me, the hurricane was worse than this um, death going down. So this bill will especially will be important for my constituents. I'm a little bit disappointed that the continuing resolution was attached to the bill. 
Um, I do support the reopening of the government. However, this should be not the vehicle uh, for it. The disaster supplemental was intended to help people to recover and rebuild for natural disasters. And I really appreciate the good faith effort of all involved here to help those struck by natural disasters, not just in Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and Florida, but um, the, the fires in, the Californ in California as well, especially in Puerto Rico. However, it's my hope that this become a clean bill between the House and the Senate and can be signed by the President. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentle lady yields back. The gentle lady from New York is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to the gentlelady from the U.S. Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett. The gentlelady from the United States Virgin Islands is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentlewoman from New York for her and her staff, as well as the members of the committee, putting together this supplemental disaster uh, appropriation, H.R. 268 which seems to address many of the issues that uh, the territories and other areas that have been affected by disaster are continuing to face. Additionally, sending a strong message to the administration about the slow walking and the additional uh, restrictions that they have put in funding that Congress had already uh, passed both here in the House as well as on the Senate side and the President himself stand. So this disaster supplemental bill contains much needed support for ongoing disaster recovery efforts in my district, the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as Puerto Rico and other disaster affected states and territories. For the Virgin Islands, this bill, as well as for Puerto Rico, addresses federal cost share for all FEMA public assistance grants, including for debris removal and emergency measures to protect public health and safety, if you can believe we're still dealing with debris removal, and for permanent infrastructure restoration for the duration of the recovery from Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Additionally, of the funds provided for EPA programs, well, I'm very pleased to see that 74.6 million is set aside to the Virgin Islands to improve drinking water and wastewater systems resiliency. This is a very positive relief package for Americans in our island territories, still reeling from unprecedented disaster, still reeling from a place where our hospitals are back, not back in operation, and where our children just went back to a full day of school this October after over a year. I'm pleased that the House will be sending a firm message to the administration that its recent decisions not to con continue the waiver of cost share of public assistance to the Virgin Islands would severely hinder the territory's ongoing recovery. I would also like to take this opportunity to express my strong opposition to diverting disaster funds to build a border wall, which would create the a true national emergency. I yield back. The gentle lady. Um, the gentle lady from Texas. Is I reserve the balance of my time. The gentle the lady from Texas reserves. The gentle lady from New York is recognized. I reserve. And the gentle lady from New York reserves. I reserve and I'm prepared to close. You close. The gentle lady from Texas is recognized. Sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to vote no on this measure and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentle lady yields back. The gentle lady from New York. Mr. Speaker, to allow federal agencies to begin the vital work that we are funding in this bill, we must reopen the federal government. I'm pleased that the bill before us includes a continuing resolution to immediately reopen the federal government and pay federal employees who are going through such a difficult time taking care of their families, putting food on the table, just going through the normal, normal time that families have to endure when they don't have any money to spend. This would pay federal employees through February 8th. This continuing resolution ensures the federal government is working for the American people, provides certainty for federal employees, gives President Trump and the Congress time to negotiate on border security and immigration policy. 
Mr. Speaker, this legislation is a critical first step to meeting our fellow citizens' urgent needs as they recover from recent disasters. So I urge my colleagues, join me in support of this bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Does the gentlelady yield her time back? I yield. The gentlelady has yielded her time. All time for general debate has expired. The pursuant to the rule, an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of rules committee print 116-2, modified by the amendment printed in part A of House Report 116-2, shall be considered as adopted, shall be considered as an original bill for purpose of further amendment under the five-minute rule, and shall be considered as read. No further amendment to the bill as amended is in order except those printed in Part B of House Report 116-2. Each such further amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report by a member designated in the report, shall be considered read, and shall be debatable, debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for the for division of the question. It is now in order to consider amendment number one printed in part B of House Report 116-2. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number one, printed in part B of House Report number 116-2, offered by Mr. Bishop of Georgia. Pursuant to House Resolution 43, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Bishop, and a member opposed, it shall control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia. Uh, Mr. Chair, I rise to speak on behalf of uh, this amendment, which is co-sponsored by my very good friend, the gentleman from Georgia, Congressman Austin Scott, and 12 other distinguished members on both sides of the aisle. As I said during general debate, Hurricane Michael devastated my district and left a path of destruction all the way up to Virginia. Across the state of Georgia, many producers suffered nearly 100% crop loss. Damages were experienced by the pecan, peanut, cotton, vegetable, and timber industries. And this was the third straight year these folks were hit. A few weeks before that, Hurricane Florence hit the Carolinas, causing $22 billion in damage. Last year, Californians witnessed another devastating wildfire season, while Hawaii suffered from volcano damage. The Northern Marianas were hit by typhoons, and American Samoa by a horrific cyclone. This disaster supplemental bill provides funds to begin addressing these needs for our agriculture and our rural communities. The bill increases payments for losses from 85 to 90 percent for producers who have crop insurance and from 65 to 70 percent for producers without crop insurance. Unfortunately, the 1.1 billion in the bill was based only on USDA's assessments of need nationwide. However, the various state departments of agriculture, uh, those states that were devastated by these disasters, submitted to the committee assessments which came to over $7 billion to ensure that more of these needs can be fully met. Mr. Scott and I put our heads together. We looked at the numbers and concluded that the original estimate by the Department of Agriculture of $1.1 billion in damages could very well and was most likely going to be too low. So we've offered this amendment to increase it by $1.9 billion for a total of $3 billion. I urge a yes vote on the Bishop Scott Amendment. It is needed. Uh, we want to make sure that we can uh, do what is necessary to allow Americans who were devastated by these uh, natural disasters uh, to have sufficient recovery. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. Does, uh, what, what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek Mr. recognition? Mr. Cham Chairman, I claim time in opposition. Although it is a technical opposition, I am not opposed to the amendment. The gentleman is recognized without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Throughout middle and late October and into the 1st of November, Congressman Bishop and I 
uh, crisscrossed paths many times and sometimes, in fact, many times ended up in the same room trying to help our farmers. The storm straddled our districts. I have never seen the devastation to our crops as, as I saw over, over those couple of weeks, and that devastation is still there. I can't, I can't thank my colleague, Congressman Bishop, enough for his work and his help in this amendment. I'd also like to thank uh, his staff and, and the staff of both the Democrat and Republicans on the, the Appropriation uh, Committee. Uh, Mr. Adderholt from Alabama has been a tremendous amount of help, um, as has Ms. Granger and Chairman uh, Lowey on the Democratic side. Mr. McGovern has been a lot of help. A lot of people have reached out and been willing to help uh, those of us in the Southeast, and I, I can't say thank you enough for that. Our losses are estimated at over $5.4 billion for Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas. The underlying text of the bill is good. In fact, I think it's very good and sets a framework that will be used as we go forward in the years to, to handle disaster relief for agriculture. The primary problem is that the request of $1.1 billion currently included in the base text simply does not fund the formula for the losses. With Congressman Bishop's help, uh, we, have, we have drafted, we have worked to draft the amendment increasing that amount by $1.9 billion to a total of $3 billion, which I believe, uh, along with Mr. Bishop, more accurately reflects the need to fund the formula. With that, uh, I again hope my colleagues will support the amendment. I want to thank Congressman Bishop and the many others that have worked with us on this, and I'd like to yield uh, as much time as he would like to consume to uh, Mr. Rouser of North Carolina. It's kind of nice for as much time as he may consume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to uh, thank my good colleague and friend, uh, Austin Scott, for his leadership on this, as well as certainly the chairman, uh, Chairman Bishop uh, uh, from Georgia, who, by the way, I have heard lots about for many, many years from many mutual friends that you and I both have and look forward to working with you, not only on this, but many other matters uh, as they come before us. There is absolutely no question, uh, agriculture all across the Southeast has been significantly damaged, uh, devastated in many, many parts. Uh, in North Carolina, we're still reeling from the hurricane in 2016, Hurricane Matthew. And then, of course, Hurricane Florence came and hit not only the same areas that Hurricane Matthew hit, uh, but hit a much broader uh, area of North Carolina. In fact, uh, why don't we just say it uh, uh, really devastated uh, and inflicted a lot of harm all across uh, eastern North Carolina. This on top of a five-year decline in farm income, uh, not only in North Carolina, but all across the country. And so you've had a significant uh, shortfall in income for all these farm families all over the country, North Carolina included. Then comes Hurricane Matthew in 2016, uh, floods all those out who are in its path. And then when I say flood, I mean a real flood, flooding that you've not seen in, in many, many years. And then Hurricane Florence comes in 2018. It's not only the same areas uh, that Hurricane Matthew hits in 2016, uh, but hits a much broader uh, geographical region in North Carolina and elsewhere. So over the last five years, you've not only had a huge decrease in farm income, uh, you've had uh, all kinds of natural dis disasters, not just in North Carolina, but elsewhere. And as a result, uh, all these farm families have lost all their equity. They have no equity left. Without the disaster recovery package that Congress has previously passed and what we hope to pass eventually here uh, that's uh, uh, contained in this body of work today will be a start to rebuild to enable these folks to cash flow, to enable them just to get the financing that they need to put in the ground a new crop for the year 2019. So I commend both of my colleagues for their help and their support on this, and I encourage the rest of the body to join with us and adopt this amendment. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia. I thank the chair for yielding and to close, I just want to reiterate how important it is for us to 
pass sufficient resources in order to allow these communities that have been devastated all across the United States as well as the territories uh, so that they can recover uh, from these nat natural disasters. With that, I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Yeah. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number two, printed in part B of House Report 116-2. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk and I ask for its consideration. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number two, printed in part B of House Report number 116-2, offered by Mr. McGovern of Massachusetts. Pursuant to House Resolution 43, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, and a member of polls who each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, give, I yield myself two minutes. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't get to say this often.